let me say that I'm a physicist. We invented the transistor. We invented the laser. We helped to put together the first computer and the internet. We wrote the World Wide Web. And along the way, we also invented television. We invented radio and radar. We also created the atomic bomb. And we also created most of the space program, the GPS, weather satellites, telecommunications were all built by physicists. And we physicists love to make predictions. When we helped to assemble the internet, one physicist made a prediction that the internet would become a forum of high culture, high art, and high society. <laughs> well, today we know that 5% of the internet is pornography. But that's because teenage boys log on to the internet. Just wait until the grandmas and grandpas log on to the internet. Then 50% of the internet will be pornography. <laughs> So today, I'm going to give you a guided tour of what the next 10, 20, maybe even 50 to 100 years will look like. How will you live in the future? How will your children, grandchildren live in the future? I've had the privilege of interviewing over 300 of the world's top scientists for BBC television, the Discovery Channel, the Science Channel. And I get to take a film crew into their laboratories and tell you about the future. And maybe, just maybe you'll learn a little bit about nanotechnology and where the city of Albany fits into this whole picture. So again, the book is called Physics of the Future, New York Times bestseller. But next slide. My last book, also a New York Times bestseller, was Physics of the Impossible, which takes you not just 100 years into the future, it takes you 1,000 years into the future. We physicists can see that far away because the laws of physics are not going to change in a thousand years. Starships, possibility of time travel, possibility of teleportation. We can teleport atoms right now. Imagine one day, hundreds of years from now, maybe we'll teleport Captain Kirk right across the room. And then you ask the question, who is this imposter over there that looks like Captain Kirk, talks like Captain Kirk, and even sells Priceline like Captain Kirk. I mean, who is this imposter over there? These are the kinds of philosophical questions that you also have to ask. Next slide. But let me now say something about the crisis of capitalism today. Some people say, how can you possibly predict 10, 20, 30 years into the future when no one predicted the crash of 2008? Well, it's not quite that simple. There were people who predicted the crash of 2008. So let's now talk about why we had a crash. And then let's talk about the future. First of all, why do we have crashes? Because where does wealth come from? Wealth comes from, ultimately, science. Science is the engine of wealth. But wealth and science do not come uniformly. One invention creates an avalanche, a wave. The first wave was steam power. That created tremendous wealth called the Industrial Revolution. Next slide. And when we physicists worked out the thermodynamics of steam engines, that made possible locomotives. We physicists could calculate almost precisely how much energy you can extract from a steam engine to make a locomotive. That created wealth, fantastic wealth. All of a sudden, we had factories in the 1800s. All of a sudden, the textile industry was changed. All of a sudden, England became a great industrial power. But wealth is restless. Wealth is never static. Wealth has to go someplace. And where did the wealth created by steam, created by physicists, where did that go? The London Stock Exchange. A bubble formed, a huge bubble on the London Stock Exchange, the likes of which no one had ever seen before. 200 locomotive stocks being sold on the London Stock Exchange. It was unsustainable. And what happened? It popped. And we had the first Great Depression. Next slide. Well, you figure 80 years later, 80 years later, almost to the dot, you figured that we learned a lesson. But oh no. You see, this time we physicists turned our eyes away from steam power to electricity. 
We physicists worked out the, the theory of motors, generators, the theory of transformers, the theory of light bulbs, also the gasoline-fired car. That created wealth, fantastic wealth, wealth unimaginable. And where did it go? The American Stock Exchange. And what did it create? A bubble. A huge bubble that was unsustainable. Next slide. And what happened to the bubble? It popped. Well, you think we learned something, right? Oh, no. 80 years, almost like clockwork, 80 years later, we physicists created something else. The transistor, the laser, the electronic computer, and all these great inventions by physicists and engineers created a bubble, a huge bubble, the bubble of prosperity of the last few decades. But wealth is restless. It has to go someplace. So where did this fantastic wealth go? It created two bubbles. One bubble in America, one bubble in Europe. The first bubble was in subprime mortgages, and it popped in 2008. The second bubble is a bubble in the Mediterranean lifestyle. Unsustainable. It popped. In fact, it's popping even as we speak. It is popping. So the next question, next slide. The next question is, if the first wave of wealth was steam power, leading to the crash of 1850, if the second wave was electricity, leading to the crash of 1929, if the third wave was high tech, leading to the crash of 2008, then the next question is, and this affects everybody in this room, what is the fourth wave? The first wave, steam. The second wave, electricity, gasoline. The third wave, high technology. What is the fourth wave? Next slide. Well, let's take a guess. The fourth wave is probably a combination of nanotechnology, artificial intelligence, biotechnology, and that's what we're gonna talk about today. And that's where the city of Albany comes into the picture that's why this institute, where we're sitting right now, comes into play. What is the fourth wave? This is very important for your grandkids, because your grandkids will probably experience another crash in 2090. <laughs> Next slide. So let's talk about Moore's Law. Why are we here today in this room? Why is America boasting its Silicon Valley? Why do we have Apple computers and iPods and iPads? Well, there's something called Moore's Law. You probably heard about it. It simply says a computer power doubles every 18 months. Now look at that curve. This is the most important curve in modern history. And you can set your clock to it. On a log scale, it's a straight line. It don't take a genius to figure out what a computer's gonna look like in 10 years. I can predict right now what a computer's gonna look like in 2020. The destiny of the computer is to disappear. Where do we have electricity today, for example? Electricity is in the floor, the ceiling, the wall. We don't even say the word electricity anymore. No one says that word anymore. We meter it. Where is electricity? Everywhere and nowhere. Where is running water today? Running water is under your feet, in the wall, in the ceiling. What do you do with running water? You meter it. Where is running water? Everywhere and nowhere. Paper also followed that same law. In 10 years, according to this chart, a penny and chip, that power will cost a penny. That's the cost of bubblegum wrappers. That's the cost of scrap paper. Computers will be everywhere and nowhere. And how will we meter it? In the cloud. So computer technology is not so different from running water, not so different from paper, not so different from electricity. They are everywhere and nowhere. So let's talk about how you will get online in the future. Next slide. This is the internet. You see the internet corresponds to wealth and prosperity. Where there's no internet, there's poverty, sickness, and disease. 
Science is the engine of prosperity. It's also the engine of democracy. It energizes, empowers people. So where will the internet of the future be? Next slide. The internet of the future will be everywhere, including your wristwatch, furniture, and your eyeglasses. These eyeglasses recognize people's faces. When you look at somebody in the future, you'll see their biography right next to their name. If they speak in Chinese to you, you'll see subtitles underneath the image of the person you're talking to. So how many times have you been at a meeting like this and you bump into somebody and you say, who is this person? Jim, John, Jake, I know this person. Who is this person? In the future, your eyeglasses will say, it's Jim, stupid. <laughs> you met him last semester. How many times do I have to remind you? And let's say you graduate from this university. You're looking for a job. You're at a cocktail party. You know there's some very big heavy hitters at that cocktail party, but you don't know who they are. In the future, you will know exactly who to suck up to at any cocktail party. <laughs> Next slide. But maybe you don't want to look like a refugee from Star Trek. <laughs> Children are the engine behind Moore's Law. Not so much the military. It used to be the military that needed tremendous computer power. You realize that video games is bigger than all of Hollywood? Bigger than all of Hollywood. That's how big video games are. And what do, what do video games need? Raw computer power. That's what's driving this. In the future, it'll be fashionable to have the internet in your eyeglasses. Next slide. You'll have the image beamed into the retina of your eye. You can also use the lens as a screen. Many ways to see the internet in your eyeglass. Next slide. This is the future of your home office. This is how you will communicate. <laughs> And this is how fashion models will look in the future. Next slide. Fashion models will see this as being, hey, high culture, high class. This is your home entertainment center. Now, there's a problem here. Let's be blunt about this. There's a problem. Let's say you don't wear glasses. Let's say you don't like glasses. Then what are you going to do? Next slide. You will put the internet in your contact lens. When you blink, you will go online. And who are the first people to buy these things? Albany students studying for final examinations. <laughs> you will blink, and you will see all the answers to all your exam questions right inside your contact lens. And who's the second person to buy these things? President Barack Obama, so that he doesn't have to use teleprompters anymore. Actors, actresses will see their entire script right inside their, their contact lens. And who else is going to buy these things? Tourists. When you go to Rome today for the first time, what a disappointment. There's no Roman ruins. The Colosseum is a mess. There's nothing left of the Roman Empire. However, in the future, you will resurrect the entire Roman Empire in your contact lens as you walk through the ruins of Rome. And who else is going to buy these things? Artists. They'll be able to wave their hands. Architects will be able to refabricate skyscrapers just by moving their hands as they see the entire image of their artwork inside their contact lens. And who else will create these things? Let's not be stupid. The military. The military already has an operational version of this, and it's already on the battlefield. It's called Land Warrior. I took a group of filmmakers from the Science Channel, flew down to Fort Benning, Georgia, and I had a demonstration of the military version of this. This is coming faster than you realize. Next slide. So this is called augmented reality. This is how we will live in the future. Virtual reality is for children. You put on glasses, you see cartoons. That's for ch kids. Virtual re augmented reality is for adults. You talk to somebody, you see their biography. You see their, their uh, subtitles right underneath. And this is also going to affect your love life. Let's say it's Friday night on a university and you have no date. What do you do? You get stone drunk. In the future, what are you going to do? You're going to load up by putting on your contact lens because you will sign up for a dating service. And as people walk by you, their faces will light up because they too have signed up for a dating service and they're looking, they're looking for love. And so you will know exactly looking at a room like this, 
you will know exactly who's available, who's interesting, who's interested in you, and whether or not they fit your characteristics. I tell you, man, this is big, okay? <laughs> Everyone's gonna want these things. Next slide. So this is called augmented reality. Now, where have you seen this before? You've seen this before in a Hollywood movie. Virtual reality imposed upon reality. Where have you seen this before? In the movie, next slide. Here's the former governor of California <laughs> in a very bad mood. This is the Terminator robot. And number left, you see how the Terminator sees things. Information is imposed on reality. That's how the Terminator robot locates John Connor. This is how you will locate your future wife, your future husband, your future employer, your future friends. It'll all be compliments of the internet. Next slide. And here's the military version. Like I said before, I flew down to Fort Benning, Georgia. I had a chance to put that on. It's a helmet. The actual device is a quarter of an inch across. Quarter of an inch across. You simply flip it down right over your eyepiece, and you see the internet of the battlefield. We actually took a camera and filmed the, the view right from that eyepiece. You see enemy forces, friendly forces, artillery, armor, all of it laid out, the entire battlefield on your contact lens. Also, who will wear these things? Fighter pilots in dogfights. Let's say you're in a dogfight in, in, in the heavens, and an enemy airplane goes underneath your airplane. You are dead meat. You can't see them. The enemy airplane is underneath your airplane. But the military plans to put a TV camera underneath the jet. That TV camera will shoot the image into your contact lens, and you will have X-ray vision you will see right through any object by blinking on your contact lens. Because there's a camera that beams the image behind an object into your contact lens. So this is the future of how we will interact, how we will live, how we will play. Next slide. So on the right is the future of your wristwatch. If in your wristwatch you'll have full internet capability, uh, on the left, your cell phone will have your finance, your banking. You'll simply talk to it like a secretary. You'll say, uh, we want to go to dinner, make a reservation at a restaurant, or I have to take an airplane in, in a few more hours, make the plane reservation. You'll have a little bit of artificial intelligence inside your, inside your cell phone.